Thank you. It's always hard being the last speaker on the last day, but welcome to Scale with NSQ. Um, yes, so my name is Georgie. Uh, I'm a back-end software engineer, originally from Sydney, Australia, uh, and I moved to New York in about the summer of last year to uh, work at Bitly. For those who haven't heard of Bitly, uh, we're a really popular URL shortener. Um, most of our stack is written in Python and Go, and on average we serve around 8 to 10 billion clicks per month, and that works out to be about 8,000 requests per second. We then compute a lot of interesting analytics around how and where those links are shared. Um, so we get to tackle lots of interesting problems of scale at Bitly. Um, and one of the core pieces of our architecture is NSQ. So what is NSQ? Well, it's uh, an open source, real-time distributed messaging platform that was built in-house in Bitly, uh, and it's written entirely in Go. It's now been in production for over three years um, and is used by a range of companies that you can see here. And there are three core components that make up NSQ that I'm go going to go over in this talk. So to explain how NSQ works, we'll start with a really simple example and build on top of that. So let's say, for example, this is really early Bitly. We have a single host and an API that shortens links and returns synchronously to our API clients. And then a new requirement comes in to track metrics against these requests. The, the naive approach here would be to add in a step before we send the response back, which, uh, where we synchronously write into our metric system before returning back to our client. But what would be the problem with this approach? Um, well, what happens when our metric system goes down? Will our API requests then hang or fail? What happens when our API becomes really popular? How will um, we hail uh, scaling increasing API request volume or breadth of metrics collection? So we're starting to see that this current setup has a tight coupling problem. And if we continue to build additions to this system in the same way, we'll end up with a real mess of interconnected components. One way to resolve all of these issues is to perform the work of writing into our metric system asynchronously. That is, place our data in some sort of queue and write into our metric system via some other process that consumes that queue. This decoupling allows the system to be more robust and fault tolerant. At Bitly, we use NSQ to achieve this. Let's talk briefly about a couple of basic messaging patterns which are core concepts of NSQ. This is a broadcast delivery mechanism. You can see that the message is copied across and delivered to two distinct groups of consumers, A and B. For example, A here could be consuming, uh, could be something that updates the metric system, and consumer B might be one that writes, metri um, writes the messages to disk for audit logging. So what does this pattern achieve? Well, it allows us to decouple producers and consumers. The producers don't need to know about who is consuming the message, and similarly, the consumers don't know or care where the data comes from. Next, we have the distribution pattern. In this messaging pattern, data is pushed down a pipe where we then load balance messages across our con connected consumers. You'll notice both consumers are the same color and they're both called consumer A. So they're going to be doing the same work. And that could be, for example, writing messages to disk for audit logging. What this pattern allows for is horizontal scalability. As the volume of our stream changes, we can introduce and retire consumers as required to handle variable throughput. The other advantage of this pattern is that it's great for failure cases. So let's see what happens when one of our consumers fail. Got to love that animation. Um, when the next message comes through, we see that the, cumus, the consumers that are still available will continue to be able to handle the throughput. And lastly, when all the consumers die in a fire, our queue will hang on to those messages until such a time when new consumers can come back online to handle them. These message patterns are the building block for something called NSQD, which is the first component in the larger NSQ architecture. NSQ has the concept of topics and channels, which are implemented as primitives. A topic is a unique stream of messages, and a real-world example of this at Bitly might be our clicks topic, 
which is a stream of messages for every click that is made on a BitLink on the internet. And a channel is a given copy of that stream of messages for a given set of consumers. At Bitly, for example, we might add a few channels off the clicks topic, such as metrics channel to count all the things, a spam analysis channel to understand if these were in fact, in fact legitimate clicks or if they were spam, an archive channel which writes each of these messages to disk that, so that our data science team can do some analysis at a later point. Under, these, under the hood, topics and channels are both independent queues too. And these properties enable NSQ to support both multicast, which is a topic copy, copying each message to end channels, and distributed message delivery, where a channel equally divides its messages among end consumers. And it's important to point out here that both topics and channels are created at runtime, so there's no need to describe this hierarchy up front. As producers come and write messages to a given topic, the topic will be created. Conversely, if consumers um, come, the channels that they are subscribing to will be created. So let's see this in action. Firstly, I'll just add a few consumers. Um, so a message is pushed through NSQD and copied across in a topic to all the channels. It's then load balanced to the connected consumers for a specific channel. And I'll just show that again. So the message is copied across and then delivered to just one of the consumers. Um, so what we've just seen here is a combination of broadcast messaging with load balancing and fault tolerance. Oh. <laughs> I have to go through all of them. Yay. Um, so what's happening under the hood? Most of this stuff is implemented in, with Go channels. Specifically, NSQ leverages buffered channels to manage in-memory message queues and writes overflow to disk. So NSQ has this concept of a high watermark, where during extended downtime of a downstream system, messages will be kept in memory until they reach that watermark, and after which time they'll be written to disk. Then when the downstream systems come back online, the messages both on disk and in memory will be sent. Topics and channels are independent. And this means that if one of your downstream systems is having issues, then only a single channel will back up. And all of the other channels for that topic will still be able to successfully process messages. Let's go back now to that example of our simple API that we had at the beginning of the talk. And we'll walk through some steps to add in NSQD. So firstly, um, we'll spin up an instance of NSQD on the same host that runs our API. Next, we'll update our API application to publish to the local NSQ instance to queue events. Now, instead of directly writing synchronously into the metric system, we'll instead write to NSQD. And this can be as simple as performing a HTT POST request. Lastly, we'll build a consumer in a language of our choosing and using an NSQ client library, subscribe to that stream of data coming through the channel. Our consumers can then process the events and write asynchronously into our metric system. Our consumers can also just be run locally on the same host as our API and NSQD instance. By adding in NSQD, we've now decoupled the production and consumption of data, which means that if the metrics system experiences issues, it will be isolated from our system's ability to shorten links and return to our external clients. The other nice approach of co-locating everything is that we can scale horizontally. We can easily put a load balancer in front of two or more hosts and continue to in handle increases in incoming volume. NSQ Lookup D is the second component of the NSQ architecture. So um, what does a typical NSQ cluster look like? Here you can see three co-located NSQ D instances with um, their API. The API is publishing locally to NSQD, and topics are created as run at runtime. When the first message is received by NSQD on a topic, it'll push a registration message over to all Lookup D hosts. Lookup D is the daemon that manages topology information, and it's basically just a directory service which matches topics to producers. Lookup D instances don't coordinate. 
So that means that they each have their own independent copy of the mapping of topics to producers. And this gives some nice fault-tolerant characteristics. So you could, for example, lose one of these um, lookup D instances, and the others would continue to service requests just fine. In a typical data center, you might see three of these. So why um, have we, why the need to add lookup D here? Well, if we took lookup D out of the picture, each consumer would uh, need to hard code the address of where each of the NSQD instances live. And this is kind of a pain. What you really want is for the configuration to evolve and be accessed at runtime based on the state of the NSQ cluster. The NSQD instances maintain a persistent TCP connection to the lookup D instances and register themselves as a, as a producer for a given topic and all the channels that they know about. This means that consumers can query lookup D uh, for topic locations rather than hard coding them. When they get the IP addresses of these producers, they union them all together and then subscribe to all of them directly. I'm having animation fail here. <laughs> um, So over time, um, these consumers will learn about the existence of new producers and be able to route around failures. Because in this example, we have co-located NSQD instances with our API, what we've done is seamlessly create three shards that our external stream feeds into. And that isn't something that we needed to configure up front. And again, comes as a side effect of our deployment. So back to our original service that we're scaling again. This time, we'll see what happens when we add in lookup D and some new consumers. So NSQ will log in and push a registration event across. Now let's say that we want to archive this topic. We can use a, a NSQ to file, which is a tool bundled with the NSQ um, binary download. And all it does is write streams to disk. This tool works the same way as other consumers, where it continually checks in with Lookup D to find out where the topics are being produced. The consumers can then connect to all discovered producers and subscribe to their topics. So now we have a second group of consumers that is consuming the same data and performing some action. And this archived uh, data can be really useful um, because it can be pushed into things like S3 um, or Hadoop and be used for like an audit log for any production problems. So we've seen in this example how discoverability works within NSQ. By using the lookup directory service, lookup D directory service, we've been able to decouple producers from consumers. And adding in our new set of consumers was really trivial. We just specified what topic we were interested in and queried lookup D. So what are some NSQ guarantees? Well, messages are delivered at least once, which means you can and will receive dupl duplicates. And this could be for a var variety of reasons, such as client timeouts, disconnections, or requeuing of messages. It's the client's responsibility to perform uh, item, item potent operations or dedupe. Messages are also not durable by default. We talked previously about the configurable high watermark, but by default, at Bitly, we run with a hybrid in-memory on-disk setup. Messages received are unordered, so you can't rely on the order of messages being delivered to consumers. And this is a result of requeues and the combination of in-memory and on-disk storage, and the fact that each NSQD node shares nothing. Consumers will eventually find all topic producers. The discovery service, NSQ Lookup D, is designed to be eventually consistent. And as mentioned previously, uh, Lookup D nodes don't coordinate to maintain or state or answer queries. Topic and channel pausing are a couple of handy features of NSQ tooling. Here we have some channels similar to previous slides. Uh, we've got the metrics channel, a reporting channel, and an archives channel. We already know that normally messages get copied, they get delivered, and processed successfully. But now let's see what happens when we pause the clicks topic. Messages start pooling at the topic level. And this is really useful for a variety of um, operation things, such as renaming channels or introducing new ones in an atomic window. Um, you could also introduce new systems that you want your data to write into. When we unpause, the messages will be processed successfully.
We also have channel pausing. And if we pause the reporting channel here, then messages will queue at that channel um, and again be, un, uh, be processed successfully when we unpause. A couple more tooling features. So this image here is of NSQ admin, and that's the final component of the whole NSQ um, architecture. And what NSQ admin does is allow you to view aggregated cluster statistics in real time and perform various administrative tasks. So it will show things like queue depths, how often messages are being requeued, and how fast clients are processing things. Um, it will also allow you to do things like pause channels and topics. And lastly, NSQ has uh, something called ephemeral channels. And these are channels that disappear when your last client disconnects and are useful for one-off scripts or inspecting a stream for debugging purposes. Um, so that's all I have. Uh, you can find a copy of my slides at this link. And I thought, given that this is like the final talk on the final day, rather than keeping everyone here to answer questions, maybe what I'll do is leave it here. And if you do have any questions, come up and see me. Thank you.